passion and a hunger to serve God, and not necessarily in the natural knowing exactly what it was he had for us to do, but he knew we, we knew he had something for us to do. I was so naive and so hungry that one night I rolled down my window driving home from a midweek service, looking at the sky, saying, if you can write on the wall for Belshazzar, you can write in the sky to tell me. Now, it was naive in the sense that it's going to come from his word or through one of the gifts of the Spirit, but there was, there was a, a faith there that knew that God would, would minister and bring the answers that we needed. And then as we got into this, we had a, a pastor say to us one time, he said, concerning working in the church, finding your place, he says, start doing something. Doesn't matter what it is. Start doing something, and as you do, God will lead you to the place that you have to be. But he said, if you refuse to start and do something, he said, you're like a ship tied to a dock. And until that ship gets out on the water, it cannot be steered. There's a lot of tied up ships. And because of it, churches aren't having the effect that God intends for them to have. And it won't be the pastor's fault. Amen? And I'm not saying that as a heavy, I'm just saying, do something. Be a blessing. Love one another. Find your place. Walk in it. Walk in that anointing. Amen? Amen. Amen. Go over to 100, verse 130. Talking about his word. His thoughts becoming our thoughts. Just the very fact that it says here, the entrance of his word, the entrance of your words gives light, reaffirms to me that he wants me to know his thoughts. He wants me to know his ways. Amen? Amen. Or it would say, my thoughts and my ways can't enter you, and you'll stay in the dark. <laughs> doesn't say that. He says the entrance of his word gives light. What does light help you to do? It helps you to see. It shines on something. Something that was hidden is revealed. We, you know, we just had our offering, and we heard about bringing our tithes and offerings out of Malachi. Years ago, I was meditating on that before I had to receive an offering. In our church, in our home church, before every and I went to Rhema, I wasn't on, well, I was on staff earlier as an administrator, but I wasn't on pastoral staff. But I received the offering every Sunday morning. It's one of the things the pastor had me do. And um, because you did it week after week, you didn't want to say the same thing every week. So I would study that out. I would look at some things. And one, one week I was, I was meditating on Malachi 3. Bring all the tithes and offerings, you know, into my house, says the Lord. And I'll open the windows of heaven. And as I was meditating on the windows of heaven, my wife gets, um, she calls them mini visions, M-I-N-I, -I, visions, and not that she's ever had a grandi, well, once she has, but usually just mini visions, and she always gets them in cartoon form, <laughs> it's always a cartoon, and, uh, you know, when, uh, when she read the scripture of go ye into all the world, you know, how uh, she sees a pair of high cut sneakers, and instead of the Nike logo on the, on the little round part on the ankle, it says go ye. Right? That's, and that's, she sees that from God as a cartoon. And um, anyway, so she had shared with me, actually had showed me what she had seen, you know, and it's, uh, it's the heavens with the clouds, and all of a sudden there's a window opening and the blessings are falling out based on that scripture. God had showed her in a cartoon. So as I was meditating on that, the Spirit of the Lord said to me, and God will do this to you. This is how you get God's thoughts. You know, you just think on something, and you tumble it, and you turn it, and you look at it from different sides. That's what meditating is. And I'm, I'm doing that with this, thinking about what my wife had showed me and stuff. And as I'm doing that, just the still small voice says, what kind of windows did they have then? <laughs> and I go, that's a good thought. And all of a sudden, that's like, I said, well, Lord, I said, I guess they didn't have glass panes the way that we think. I guess.
guess it was just a hole in the wall that they would have had wooden shutters that would close. He goes, exactly, son. That's what they had. He said, so when I tell you that I'll open the windows of heaven and pour out blessings, he says, the shutters open. Now you can see. You get vision. You get, and the light shines on something. We think it's just he's going to tumble stuff down. No, the windows are open, and now he starts letting you see. He lights your path. He starts showing you what's ahead. I tell our church almost every week, this is this by the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God said to me one time, he said, he said, prosperity is for the believer, but prosperity is often disguised, listen to this, often disguised as opportunity, and opportunity is often called work. <laughs> There's too many of us in the Word of Faith camp that got a hold of the giving and receiving thing and the prosperity message and want to sit on our couch all afternoon and watch soaps and somehow think God is going to bless us. He said a man that doesn't provide for his own is worse than an infidel. Talking about a believer. He expects us to put our hands to something. And if you're in the social service realm and it's a place you need to be to help you get a hand up, praise God for it. But don't get stuck there. God wants every person in the body to be a contributor. He wants you to have something to give. And as soon as you stay in that world system and cycle, you put a cap on what God can do. You can't go higher than what the government will give you. Are you hearing me? I'm talking like a pastor now. Hmm. He wants you to, he wants you, he wants to see you blessed. An opportunity comes in all different shapes and forms to all of us. I happen to flip stuff. I still do. I sell firewood. Not that I meant to be in the firewood business. Opportunity came my way and I said yes. And God blew it to way bigger than I ever dreamed he would. Or now we have power splitters and buzz saws and tractors and dump trucks. And I have not bought one stick of wood. And when the dump truck leaves the yard, there's $440 worth of wood on it. What's it called? Opportunity. You know what splitting firewood's called? Work. <laughs> work. He does it in all kinds of ways. I just bought a, I, I came across a, a little tractor sitting on the side of the road. Drove by it for two, three months. Never moved. Brand new tractor that we bought out of my brother's dealership. See the price tag on it. They wanted 18.5. Thinking, what a waste to see that thing sitting there. Time and time and time. Finally, I knocked on the door. I said, did you lease that? They went, yep. I said, how much you got to go on the lease? Seven months. Here's what I'll do. I'll buy out your lease, and I'll give you an extra 75 bucks a month to help you recover some of your costs. I'll take over the tractor. What's the buyout on it? 8800 Okay, I'll buy it out when it's done. Well, guess what? I took that tractor home, paid the lease for seven months, bought, paid Aco Alice $8,800 on July 1st, that tractor is on Kijiji today for $19,200. <laughs> What's that called? Opportunity. And I said to the lady that had bought, I said, and what will happen when it sells, to be fair to you, because you paid all, and all, had 187 hours on it when I got it, after five years. Mm. I said to the lady that bought it, I said, because you paid this lease and hardly used that thing when it sells, I commit to you, you'll get four and a half thousand dollars. But she let me take the tractor. Mm -hmm. She knows I'm a man of my word. I made every payment I said. I gave her a little bit extra every month, like I said. And when that tractor sells, she will get some of that back. What does it do? It blesses her and it blesses me. Opportunity. Anyway, where are we? <laughs> Verse 130. That was a little side trip. <laughs> the entrance of your word gives light. 
It gives understanding to the simple. I'm simple. I try to stay simple. I call it redneck. <laughs> I try not to get too sophisticated because it just messes a lot of stuff up. I love what Brother Hagen said. Brother Copeland says, it. God said it. I believe it. That settles it. No more discussion. No more argument. No more debate. Amen? My, uh, I said I would talk a little bit more about my dad's 85th birthday. This is a good place to bring it up. My mom and dad are from a province in Holland called Friesland. Mm -hmm. Friesland is different than Holland in that the language isn't even the same. They speak Frisian, not Dutch. Mm -hmm. Frisian is closer to English than almost any other language in the world. And um, it's an old tribe. The Dutch came from the Germanic side. Frisians go back way, way beyond that. They used to cover the whole North Sea. And they're a proud people in a, in a good way. But to the Dutch, they're simple and unsophisticated. I thought, well, that's a good reputation to have. Is there any newfies in here? They're, they're a little bit looked at like the newfie is in Canada. Except in the sense of they're more like Quebec in that they have their own language. But that's how different it is. So I had it on my heart for my dad's 83rd birthday to bring in a team of Frisian horses with a carriage. Now the Frisian horse is an elegant, elegant, beautiful black horse. Yes. It's a gorgeous horse. And, and the truth is um, there's more Frisians bred in your area here than almost anywhere in the world except for Holland. And, uh, yeah, uh, Hollywood uses a Frisian horse today almost more than any other horse because it's such an elegant-looking horse, but also because it's such an easy, good-tempered, easy-mannered horse to work with. So my dad didn't know this was coming. There'll be some pictures on my Facebook page. Um, there are, some are already up, but he's just shocked when he sees the trailer pull in yesterday morning. But we brought in a team of, team of Frisians from Otterville here with the drivers, and and my dad's dream was to give all 74 of his kids, grandkids, and great can grandkids rides on a team with Frisian horses. And everybody that showed up yesterday got to do that. Wow. <laughs> they were there from, from 11 till, till 4.30. I had made the, the farmer, I, I said to him, I said, you come out with the horses. And I said, we guarantee we will feed you well. <laughs> and we did. <laughs> and... Um, he became a Facebook friend this morning, and I said, it wasn't just that you guys came with your horses, it's like we made new friends yesterday. Mm -hmm. Right? And, 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 and in that, my dad got blessed. He was in tears. Mm -hmm. There's a Dutch word called verklempt. Mm -hmm. You're so moved that you almost don't know how to react. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened to him. Mm -hmm. he's, he's looking at it, looking at it, and then it still didn't dawn on him that <laughs> these horses were coming to his place. And all of a sudden, it's, he see it, saw the Frisian on the trailer, and it's like, <gasps> shocked. So you check my Facebook site out later on, and uh, you'll see some gorgeous pictures. They, it, God granted us the best day of the summer for it. Yeah. Cool, yeah, nice breeze, just gorgeous. And then his siblings all showed up later in the day, and we had a wonderful celebration yesterday. But I say all that to say, the Frisians are known by the Dutch as unsophisticated simple. Well, the entrance of his word gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. I never want to get so sophisticated that I can't receive God in his word. Romans tells us that